ready? Yes, they should be. Okay. Uh, welcome to this panel, which is on the topic of job guarantees in developing countries. In the next session in this same room, there's going to be a panel on a job guarantee proposal for the United States. I think it's important that 95% of the people that live on this planet, including me, including me, thank you, don't actually live in the United States. Most of the people that don't live in the United States live in developing countries. The job guarantee is uh, well developed and well known about by many of us here, I'm sure, as a proposal for the US. Does the job guarantee, or does the idea of a job guarantee generalize to countries around the world, including developing countries, or is there something about developing countries and something about the problems of affording a job guarantee in developing countries which gets in the way, or which creates problems which don't exist in the US? Uh, well, we've got a fantastic panel to talk about this topic. Um, Jan Kregel, who uh, I did have something to say about in just a few seconds, but they were precisely the same words and they came from precisely the same person that Matt Forstetter talked about yesterday evening. Jeffrey Markle said precisely the same thing to me a week ago and that he said to Matt some time ago about, about, uh, about Jan being the uh, best all-round economist in the world. Warren Mosler, who my students all regard as God, so I'm going to be Saint Stephen when I get back to Adelaide, just to be close to Warren Mosler. Uh, Fadel, who I know very well, now the president of the Binzaga Institute and uh, of course he's an expert on the job guarantee in general and uh, in Tunisia in particular. And uh, Jan, I forgot your second name. Liang, Yang Liang, thank you, who is at Willamette University and also uh, a research scholar with the Binzaga Institute and is an expert on the consequences of financial globalization and much else, and alongside Fadel, a PhD graduate of this university. So I think we're going to start with Yang. Yeah? Yeah. That microphone is just for the camera, so you need to project your Oh, it's just for the camera. Oh, yeah. well, <laughs> my goodness, I didn't know you were being filmed. Okay, I'm going to start out by making a very simple proposition, and that is that all the economies are, in a sense, developing economies. Okay? In what sense? Well, if we go and look at the traditional development literature, we always start out by talking about the problems of developing countries as having the problem of the curse or to what is often called commodity curse, or being excessively dependent on primary commodity or agricultural production. And the difficulty is that these economies are unable to generate sufficient employment for their populations in agriculture. So the basic problem that the developing country faces is if you have, as John Robinson suggested, disguised unemployment <coughs> in agriculture, what do you do? Well, the response is you find something else for them to do because if you keep them on the farm, it simply means that the average consumption of everybody in the agricultural sector is going to continue to go down. Traditional response is what? Traditional response is, okay, let's send them to manufacturing. Why are we going to send them to manufacturing? Well, first of all, we send them to manufacturing because we believe technical progress is more rapid in manufacturing. Therefore, wages will be higher. If wages are higher, then the increased incomes will provide, number one, an increased demand for manufactured goods and agricultural goods. So you manage to set up a virtuous circle. It's the domestic demand then expands the manufacturing sector. It creates more economies of scale and more technical progress. So the wages tend to rise, and you go into this very nice expansion system. Okay? Now, this means that you're solving the employment problem in the agricultural sector. But what happens in manufacturing? Well, eventually, the god of technical progress comes along and says what? Says, well, you think you solved your problem of disguised unemployment, but now you've got it in the manufacturing sector. What are you going to do? Well, you're going to have to find something else. What is the something else that we find? 
we find Donald Trump. No. <laughs> we find the service sector. We say, okay, we're going to expand into the service sector. Why? Well, we're going to expand into the service sector because the service sector is more employment intensive. It's going to allow us to absorb all of these workers we don't need in manufacturing, while manufacturing continues to pump out all of these goods, which allows everybody to consume. And we go on very happily until, well, we, until we get bread and all of these systems which say that we're going to replace everything with robots. And once we've replaced everybody with robots, what are we going to do? Okay. So the employment problem is a problem that starts in developing countries, it goes to middle income countries, it goes to advanced industrial countries, and it does not stop. So this is my argument that all countries are in a sense developing countries. They're all facing this problem. What do you do with excess labor in the sectors that you are currently using to absorb that excess labor. And this is a problem, A, that you cannot solve if you're going to have a system that tends to be driven by positive growth and technical progress. Okay? Now, first way I could now just stop and say, okay, the robot problem, we have two solutions for the robot problem. One is basic income, and the other is employer of last resort. And then we're back to the discussion that we had last night in terms of the way the Roosevelt administration handled the problem of labor during the Depression. That is, is it more sensible from the society's point of view to be providing handouts for dole, which is basically what basic income is about, or does it make more sense to allow people to be employed productively in doing things that provide not only for personal benefit, but for society? Okay, now I said I could stop there. I know we're probably very happy if I stop there because I exceeded my time, but I'm not going to. I'm going to take a step back and go back to this step. I'll yield some of my time to you. <laughs> we'll take a step back and look at this shift from primary industry to manufacturing. Okay, how do we do that? Now the standard response comes from people who say it's difficult to do this because there are supply side constraints. Okay, we have supply side constraints because oh, we don't have sufficient technology, we don't have the finance, we don't have the savings, our income levels are too low, we come from a system which is your subsistence, you don't have savings, if you don't have savings, you can't finance the investment you need to go to manufacturing. Well, one, we know that most developing countries are in fact not facing resource scarcity. They are developing countries, probably because they were colonies that were resource rich, and those resources never managed to get used domestically in order to finance this transfer. One and two, they're employment rich. We know that they have excess employment. This is the one thing that characterizes developing countries. So the question is, how do we go about this transition? So we say the argument of the supply siders is we need external finance. We need to borrow abroad in order to be able to finance this. Now, I won't go into a long story. I'll just do it very shortly. Those of you who have read uh, my work in the development literature, in short, foreign direct investment and any sort of foreign borrowing is and of itself a Ponzi scheme. It is a Ponzi scheme. It will always be a Ponzi scheme. In the end, foreign borrowing will always end up creating a financial crisis which will eliminate any benefit that you get from attempting to grow on the basis of foreign saving. This is an old thing which goes back to Keynes which says that if you're going to finance yourself domestically, you have to fund yourself domestically. How do you fund yourself domestically? Well, here we go to the question of monetary sovereignty. Every country that is in the state of development has the potential to employ monetary sovereignty by developing its own domestic financial system in order to finance the investment that it needs. Okay? But the difficulty here is what? The difficulty here is number one, it takes time. And the question is, how do you fill the gap between the time you're building up your domestic financial sector and absorbing the excess employment that you want to transfer into manufacturing? And here, where quite obviously, the question turns to providing employment. If you can't provide the employment through manufacturing directly, then you would provide it through an employer of last resort. 
employer of last resort, in this case, he's not really an employer of last resort. We call it an employer of first resort because this is the primary way in which you're able to generate those incomes which are going to be used in order to support the expansion of the manufacturing sector. Because this transition from agriculture to manufacturing also requires the fact that you're able to generate sufficient domestic demand so that you can take advantage of the economies of scale that come from the expansion of manufacturing. And where are you going to get this if you don't get it from your domestic population and domestic income. Now, the advantage of using the Employer of Last Resort program is that number one, in general, Employer of Last Resort programs require very little in terms of external financing. That is, you don't have to borrow externally in order to finance these programs. One example which has been used against this argument is the Argentinian program. The Argentinian program was supported and funded by the World Bank. This is not true. It's not funded by the World Bank. The World Bank had made loans to Argentina. The money had already been spent when the Argentinian crisis broke out. And as a face-saving measure, the World Bank allowed Argentina an, extent, an extension in repaying those loans under the guise of support of the employer. So the first part, it doesn't require, require external financing. And the second is that the foreign input content, the imported content of the program, are extremely low. Extremely low because they tend to be serviced by real resources that tend to be domestically provided. And this also then provides further support for this problem of boosting domestic demand and allowing that manufacturing sector uh, to expand. So this is the basic point that I would like to make. If we take this at the first stage, the first transition, the employer last resort plays as much a role as it does in an industrial economy facing fluctuations in its level of employment. How you use this to transfer from manufacturing into something that comes later, well, we'll leave this to Mr. Trump, I'm sure, to figure out how to do that. Thank you. In, in setting up this session is, is really to take the, the critics who say MMT doesn't and the job guarantee advocates don't really understand how things work in developing countries uh, and that this is a sort of a US centric view of the world and, and to sort of showcase uh, the arguments that we have uh, to, to counter that, that kind of narrative so um, in, in my case, I'm going to talk specifically about the case of Tunisia. I'll try to generalize a little bit, but developing countries don't all have the same kind of issues, the same kind of resources. But there is some general trends that I'd like to highlight here. And uh, the title is, I, I really mean it when I say central bankers really need help. Uh, not from the IMF, not from the World Bank, not necessarily from economists per se, but from sustainable agriculture from renewable energy, um, because that's really the issue in developing countries. It's a real resource issue, it's not a financing issue, uh, per se. And that brings me to what, uh, what Jan Kregel has, uh, has done over the years, which is to highlight the importance of mobilizing domestic resources. Um, so, so here we go. So I'd like to start with a quick overview of, of what, I'm, what I'm trying to do here with the, with the MMT perspective. You can think of countries as having, you know, uh, belonging as to, to one position on this spectrum of financial sovereignty or monetary sovereignty. Countries like the US or Japan or the UK have full financial sovereignty. And then you have countries that have lost financial sovereignty or have willingly given up their financial sovereignties. And, and countries sort of uh, in between. And, and to be more specific, just as a quick reminder, this is what we mean when we say um, financial sovereignty. I'm going to move to this slide. Um, so a country that issues its own currency, collects taxes in the same sovereign currency, uh, and only borrows or issue, issues bonds denominated in its own sovereign currency. Uh, and, and obviously having a, a flexible exchange rate regime. And this is really the part that the critics usually say, oh, you can't do that. Because then you're going to have inflation, you're going to have external debt problems, you're going to have food inflation and energy inflation, and riots on the streets. So you can't do that. You need a fixed exchange rate regime, you need austerity to keep things stable. 
too bad. There's nothing we can do. So it's the, it's the Margaret Thatcher framework for developing countries. There is no alternative, right? And, and that's what we'd like to, to challenge today. Um, a little bit of a quick overview of the history of economic development in most developing countries, Tunisia included in this case. So a post-independence kind of state-led economic development model followed by an import substitution industrialization model with the infant industry hypothesis and kind of protectionism from, from uh, foreign trade. And then leading into the 70s with these, uh, this model of export-led growth. This is the takeoff period where developing countries now have enough infrastructure to, to invade European markets and, and Western markets with their, with their cheap exports, right? Um, it turns out that the, the faster you try to accelerate your export machine, the more trade deficit you generate because you're, you're just an assembly line. You're importing high value added content, you're exporting low value added content, the net result you're losing in this game in the long run to this day. Leads to the debt crisis in the 1980s, I'm not gonna go over the details, and then the, the, the rise of the neoliberal model of economic development, the, the structural adjustment programs, the neoliberal reforms, privatizing state-owned enterprises, and then everything that, that goes with it. And I'll, I'll review this. So th these are slides for the case of Tunisia. So 1972, that's the turning point. This is the trade deficit balance. Pretty much no external debt, pretty much no trade deficit. And then you, you drive the economy into this export-led growth model, and then you go into a, a cliff, right? Uh, that cliff continues to this day. This is the rest of the picture. It's just on, on a larger scale. The, the flip side of this picture is the, the exponential increase in external debt. This is in dollars and euros and Japanese yen. So this is how you lose your financial sovereignty. And what, what Randy said today in reference to the United States, that exporters are the ones who are sort of, sort of in the decision-making, dominating these, this narrative. It's the same in, in an export-led economy. They set the decision so that you're, you're driving exports. And any, anybody who dares to say anything against this massively subsidized industry in terms of electricity and water and resources and wages and everything else, you're, you're, you're not even considered you know, a reasonable person, right? Uh, and I get that uh, frequently. So when you, when, you, when you dig into the root causes of this external debt, um, you realize in the case of Tunisia, in the case of most non-oil exporting countries in the Middle East in particular, you find two big holes in, in the system. One is uh, food deficit, and the other one is energy deficit, and again, for the non-oil exporting countries. So no matter what you do in terms of loans from the World Bank, in terms of financing, in terms of restructuring, if you're not addressing the root cause of this on the real side of the economy, you're, you're not going anywhere. And all the neoliberal policies that you're implementing, which is relying on more exports, accelerating the machine, you're digging yourself deeper, right? If you're relying on tourism, which is a heavy consumer of water resources and energy resources, you're digging yourself, yourself deeper into that hole. Um, if you're relying on any of the standard strategies, you're just making things worse over time. Um, so this is a, a little bit of specifics. So there's also the, the shortage of, um, so this is the deficit in terms of intermediate products. So this is to highlight the value added content of what you're importing, of what you're exporting you're importing a lot of intermediate products and you're exporting whatever your assembly line is, is generating, the, the low value added uh, content. Uh, this is trade balance for machinery. Obviously developing countries not producing that kind of capital uh, stuff. Um, food imports, in the case of Tunisia, in the case of Egypt, um, most countries in the Middle East are massive consumers of wheat <coughs> in particular, sugar uh, and other um, key commodities. So if you're not designing an agricultural policy to bring you closer to self-sufficiency, then you're, you're not solving uh, the root cause of the problem. Um, sugar imports the numbers here. So here's, here's a neoliberal model. More austerity, you know, driven and advocated by the export-oriented uh, industry because you want to reduce you know, income and spending domestically and drive everything to external markets. Debt restructuring, privatizing state-owned companies, which comes with increase in uh, unemployment. Uh, labor market flexibilization, this is the main thing that you know, they want to write into the Constitution if, if they can. Uh, more foreign direct investment to fuel that low value added assembly line type of industrialization. It looks good because you're employing 500 people, but in the long term, you're digging yourself deeper into, into that hole. 
uh, financial liberalization, there's always a push for that. Uh, tourism, which is very painful in terms of resources and sustainability, especially in water-stressed countries like Tunisia, like Morocco, like Jordan, it doesn't make any sense to bring an industry that consumes even more water when you don't even have enough drinking water for the population. Um, remittances, uh, ship people abroad if they can get in somewhere, right, with the immigration policy that we see in, in Europe and elsewhere. That's, that's also a brain drain, right? Um, so again, not a sustainable policy. So the whole thing is a race to the bottom to attract a little bit of FDI, a little bit of tourism, a little bit of anything that can help this. And then meanwhile, you're restructuring debt, you're increasing external debt, and we're told there is no alternative, right? The famous, the famous deal. And what we're arguing here is that there is, there is a real alternative. And what I'd like to argue is that it's a job guarantee, employment-led alternative to this kind of um, economic development model mobilizing domestic resources, labor resources, and then channeling those resources towards those two big holes that you have in your trade balance, which is agricultural production and energy production. And there's no way you can do it without focusing on sustainable agricultural policy um, because of the water scarcity issue and without focusing on renewable energy policy. Well, guess what? Tunisia just is in the process now of negotiating with a consortium of big European companies um, to set up the largest solar panel um, you know, farm in the middle of the desert and to uh, lay down cables through the Mediterranean to export it. And everybody's celebrating one more export industry. And this particular solar farm is gonna produce more than the total amount of electricity consumption of Tunisia. So just one solar farm can solve the energy problem for the country. But everybody's celebrating this is gonna bring us revenues. So we're gonna export clean energy to Europe and import oil and gas from other countries. Doesn't make any sense. Why? Because we can't finance it. The Germans will finance it, the Japanese will finance it, but we can't finance it somehow. We have the unemployed, high-tech you know, graduates. We have the skilled and the semi-skilled and the unskilled labor, but somehow we believe that we can't finance it. So we, we create another export-led industry um, in, in this sense. So I'm, I'm, I'm putting the phrase here on the famous MMT line that many people have uh, put on their PowerPoints this, this week, the last couple of days. Anything that's technically possible, technically affordable, is also financially affordable, right? So today's challenges for, for the teens and economy, as I, as I highlighted, is the trade in uh, the, the external imbalance, the energy deficit, the food deficit, the low value added industrialization strategy that, that many developing countries are, are stuck in. Um, and that you can, you can address by, by being more selective, by investing more in um, vocational training and technical training and building up industrialization in the right way, where you're actually moving up the food chain in terms of uh, value added content and being more selective with foreign direct investment. Not just any kind of factory, just come in and we'll, we'll assemble the stuff for you and we ship it abroad. Um, so that, that takes time too. Right? Um, I wanna zoom in on the, on the issue of inflation, right? Uh, and the issue of the uh, exchange rate stability, right? Because this is what our, our friends, uh, the critics say about MMT and the job guarantee in, in developing countries. So if you, if you have a flexible exchange rate system, and if you have all this trade deficit, um, and if, you, if you're not borrowing externally to finance that trade deficit, the currency will devalue. The next morning you're importing wheat, the next morning you're importing energy, you're importing it at a higher price. So now you either sell it to the local consumers at an inflated price and risk food riots and energy riots and political instability, social unrest, or you subsidize it government subsidized transportation and energy and food and, and that kind of stuff, which is what we've been doing over the years, right? So the only thing that will get rid of this inflation, this is imported inflation. This is not inflation because we have too much demand because we're, we're peaking at full employment. This is inflation that's independent of what's happening internally. You're relying on external price setters to bring you their inflation and you're just playing defense all the time by borrowing and borrowing and borrowing externally and depending more on these external uh, factors, FDI and tourism and, uh, and external loans. 
So the best way to end inflation, this kind of inflation, is to address the real resource side of the equation, which is food self-sufficiency, food production, uh, and energy production. And you can leverage the job guarantee to transition into that. So we're not saying overnight stop everything and, and just focus on, on sustainable agriculture, but you can phase it in over a five-year period, a 10-year period, a 30-year period, whatever it takes. But the problem is that this is not even on the table for most developing countries. We're just digging ourselves deeper into that hole. In some cases, literally deeper by digging and extracting more natural resources for export, low-value added uh, exports. So what I've, what I've been doing when I started digging into this was not interested in agricultural sustainability or anything per se, other than you know as, as the casual uh, type of observer. But when I started digging into this, I find myself researching uh, sustainable agriculture stuff and renewable energy stuff. And, and then I find myself looking at this, aquaponics agriculture, um, which is, uh, the, the design here is basically, you're, you're growing fish and, and fresh water, you're using a water pump to pump the water up to the plants that are not sitting in soil, but are sitting in clay pebbles and then the water comes back to, to the fish. The fish waste becomes nutrients for the plants, the plants filter everything and return clean, clean water. It's very <coughs> low tech, 100% organic sustainable agriculture. So the reason I'm interested in this, because when you start digging into what Tunisia is exporting in terms of agriculture, we're exporting things like uh, strawberries, massive consumers of water. And this is the export-oriented agriculture industry. So. They're given the most fertile land, the most precious water resources to export strawberries because it's easily marketed in Europe and it brings cash to finance the trade deficit. And then what do we do? We import oil. Oh, we're, sorry, we import wheat. So what you can do with this kind of technology is shift all the massive water consuming agriculture, all the leafy greens and all the strawberries into aquaponic system, which doesn't use soil, it can be you know, set up vertically, can be set up in, in any kind of non-agricultural setting. Uh, and in Singapore, this is, this is done vertically. In Australia, there's quite a bit of this too. And then reallocate your most fertile land and your most precious water resources to the things that you actually need for domestic consumption. That's how you end inflation. It's not by central bankers trying to manipulate the interest rate. It's, it's, this is not going to fix it. Right? And I'm not going to say much about um, renewable energy. There's been a, quite a few panels. Uh, I, think, I think you get the point. So I spend a year researching this, and then I find myself doing this at home just to <laughs> figure things out in a, in a little fish tank and, and with the help of earthworms, too, to help break down the waste. And then I, I go to Tunisia for a month and leave this on autopilot. And then I come back, and the stuff is coming through the roof. <laughs> uh, literally a slow maintenance type of type of thing and it can be done on a small scale at home it can be done on a commercial scale um, when I pitched this in, in Tunisia there was there were some even central bankers in the room and I mentioned it in passing I didn't even have these slides and that's the thing that stuck that's the light bulb central bankers are interested in aquaponics then because they know the interest rate doesn't work they know that's something else right so we're, we're trying to promote this as, as a development strategy. So think of the traditional tourism that we have in countries like Tunisia or Jordan or, or, or Lebanon and, and Morocco. Um, these countries that I'm describing have similar kinds of issues, similar kinds of problems. Most unemployment, most of the poverty issues, most of the socioeconomic dislocation issues we have in Tunisia are in the interior, not in the coastal cities. That's where the uprising started, by the way, in 2011. Um, most of the water issues, water scarcity, food scarcity issues, are also in the interior. So think of setting this up as a, uh, as a nutrition supplementary type of resource at the household level, at the village level, at the town level. Think of using sustainable agriculture, sustainable design to build small restaurants and small bed and breakfast type of things. And start developing a different kind of ecotourism that's, that brings actually tourists or more interested in this kind of stuff and willing to pay a premium for this rather than go to the traditional you know, beach and nightclub type of massive water consumers, massive energy consumer type of industry. And you can build 
on the cultural heritage of some of those towns and villages um, to create an ecotourism circuit to develop a new kind of sustainable economic model. Uh, that's food sustainable, you develop those skills, and then you can scale it up to commercial level. Um, there are solutions. We have to invest in them, we have to put resources, we have to put you know, direct domestic resources into that field. Otherwise, we just keep manipulating exchange rates and borrowing more and borrowing more and saying, we're borrowing from the World Bank to create jobs. Everybody understands you're, you're not getting paid in dollars in Tunisia. You don't need the World Bank dollars to create jobs. But people understand that you need food, and we have a food deficit. You need energy, and you have an energy deficit. So that, that framework clicked really nicely when I presented it to large audiences. And uh, hopefully in, in the next few months, we'll have some, some sort of high-level officials who will, who will buy it. And he will say, let's, let's fund this. Let's try this. And, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. John Craigle, um, who has been always my great mentor. And by the way, he was also my dissertation advisor. So if anything that I said today doesn't make sense, <laughs> then you know who to blame, right? <laughs> All right. So of course let's, you. <laughs> yeah. Well, no. <laughs> so let's talk about China. Um, so what I wanted to do today is really to connect MMT with development finance. And I'm going to use China as sort of a case study. Um, so, what I want to do first is talk briefly about the modern money theory and then connect that to uh, development finance and then I'll talk about the significance of state in providing money finance in general and job guarantee in specific. Um, so, for those of you who um, attended dinner last night and you heard Long's uh, dinner remarks, I think he already gave a very extensive theoretical exposition uh, about the connections between MMT and development finance. And, what I would do today here is you know, repeat some things that he has said, uh, maybe in a slightly different way, um, but you'll see them a lot in my slides. <laughs> um, so you've been here for a year, uh, sorry, a year, <laughs> and a day and a half. <laughs> some of you have been in this kind of you know, m and stuff for more than a year or so. Um, so you have to know some of those basics. Um, so I'm not gonna read to you, you know, line by line, but just the important, the last, um, last sentence, which I took from Rand, Randy's um, sort of book, right? The ability to impose liabilities made in unit of account and issue the money used to pay down these liabilities gives power to the authority that can be used to further the social good, right? So this is sort of, you know, some of the basics of what we have talked about um, in terms of sovereign power the government has in issuing its own currency in paying for any you know, goods and services or any resources. Now, in terms of de development finance, there are two types of theories, right? There's the mainstream approach, and there's the right approach, right? So the mainstream approach, um, as John <coughs> talked about in his 2004 article, um, the true views on uh, obstacles to development, pointed out that you know the mainstream approach is the adaptation, adaptation of Haradoma growth model that was in the 40s and 50s, which focuses on the need to increase the resources available to support growth, um, since developing nations lack the will or the ability to increase domestic savings or attract foreign capital. And so, um, <coughs> so sort of the um, Chenery and Strauss, very famous 1960s <coughs> two-gap model, right? Basically talked about developing nations don't have sufficient domestic savings or foreign exchanges, so they have to rely on foreign, uh, foreign aid, right? Except that you know, when you have President Trump that came along and said, you know, we need to put American interests first, um, then that's probably not gonna happen to have, you know, the sufficient amount of foreign aid that goes to the developing nations. I feel like 
I'm allowed to mention this name because Young Faker did it twice, right? Twice. <laughs> right? I know it gives people a headache. So. <laughs> Um, so based on this sort of analysis, right, the sole aim of development policy is to try to implement policies that would um, increase domestic savings, right? For example, remove the so-called financial repression, right? Let the financial market determine the real uh, determine the interest rate, so that would increase uh, track household savings, or trying to engage in financial liberalization, right? Provide a good environment, hospitable hospitable environment to attract foreign investors. Um, but this approach is both flawed, theoretically, right, and it's also empirically shaky. It just doesn't happen. Um, so extended savings can finance investment, we all know that, right? Credit drives investment, investment produces income, and income creates savings. We can't put you know, the bar before the horse. And I wrote a piece in 2012, which I basically talked about financing or extending credit to entrepreneurs to deploy the real resources for production and income generation must take precedence over savings and cannot be constrained by the limited amount of exi existing savings. I'm sorry that I'm doing self-referencing, but I felt that I said it very nicely five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't do it any better today. So, um, but Sudart also you know, pointed out the importance of bank credit. The, the role of banks in the process of growth is to supply finances, whereas savings and financial markets provide funding. Right, So it's very clear there. Um, on the other hand, right, relying on foreign capital is basically not sustainable. Um, as John Grego again pointed out in his two, 2004 um, G24 discussion papers, that if we want to continue to attract new flows, right, and at the same time we have the outflow of interest payment, if we wanted to make sure that we have the net flows, right, then we need to make sure that the net flow grows at the rate that is at least equal to the rate of interest paid on the existing debt. Right, that amounts to attracting new flows to pay interest on the old debt, right? A classic uh, sort of a Ponzi scheme right there. So this is clearly not sustainable. And also, it's simply a mirage to try to get this net resource transfers from the developed world to developing world. So um, this chart took out from the United Nations um, data. And what it basically shows is, as of 2016, we had a net resource transfer out of developing nations to the developed world in the amount of $500 billion. And if you add all the resources outflow from 1980s to 2012, that added up to $16 trillion, which includes $4 trillion in interest payment to the developed nations lenders. And so um, you know, that really dropped that $125 billion on average aid per year. And so, again, relying on external borrowing or external capital, that is not doable. It's not supported by any empirical evidence. Um, we do not have net resource transfer developing world in the 80s. We don't have it today. Now, that then um, suggests the developing nations need to rely on domestic resources. And as John Kringle pointed out, um, one most important unutilized resources in the developing world is their human capital, right, the labor. Um, I just checked out some of the ILO data. Um, even the developing world having, you know, having this low unemployment about 5%, but they have huge informal sector, right? Ranging from Mongolia, 17% of the info, uh, informal employment to total employment ratio, um, to Guatemala, which has about 70% of informal employment. So this is exactly what John mentioned, um, this Robinson's idea of disguised unemployment. So these are really the untapped resources to be utilized. Um, but also importantly, looking at the financial aspect, we need to develop well-functioning in the financial sector to extend credit. Um, you know, as Schopenhauer puts it, granting credit operates an, as an order on the economic system to accommodate itself to the purpose of the entrepreneur, as an order on the goods which he needs. It means instructing, instructing him, entrusting him, sorry, with productive forces. It only does the economic development could arise. So on the financial side, we need to build this kind of financial sector that would extend credit in order to initiate production and income generation. And there's a large body of research, um, even coming from the ministry, that talked about, you know, we need banks, right? We need financial institutions to allocate resources and so on and so forth. But without the state support, it would be, I would argue, it would be difficult if it's not impossible for the private sector single-handedly to provide that kind of financing. Um, it's not even clear whether financial development drives economic growth or the other way around. Um, there's a lot of debate and um, empirical evidence has been mixed on this front. 
So that again was the importance of the role of the state, right, in providing development in general and in providing for new families. Again, um, Gregor <laughs> talked about in his 2004 paper that um, the key to development was to promote technical progress and the form of managerial organization and learning supported by a framework of state support and direction that provides risk sharing and so on and so forth. And he specifically talked about, you know, a strong local state provided financing <coughs> and risk sharing for heavy capital investments undertaken by enterprises. And that refers to the specific South Korean case that the state banks tribal banks <coughs> nexus is the root of Korea's success. <coughs> and if you look at domestic saving, um, before the industrial takeoff in South Korea, their savings, national savings rate, is about 10% of GDP in 1962. And once the industrialization took place, their saving rose to about 28% of GDP by the 1980s. So that, again, clearly shows that you know, the state um, extended credits through banks, state-owned banks, state-directed banks, um, in order to initiate the kind of entrepreneurial investment, which then drives income, which then bring about savings. Um, I just want to make it a little bit more explicit um, from what we just sort of saw. So, oh, sorry. I thought it was a, <laughs> I thought it was a reminder. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, Right, so you know, Korea's case, Japan's case, and China's case, uh, for that matter, um, really showcase that you know the state directed the, the credit expansion, which basically stand ready to guarantee unlimited financing and risk bearing, uh, and that's all what you know sort of started the development process. And I would argue that China provides a very interesting case study. Um, now, one thing to bear in mind is, yes, China used to have this kind of pact exchange rate system up until 2005. But still, um, China has been implementing very tight capital control, which means you know, the external sort of uh, forces can't really, to a very large extent, determine these exchange rates. Right? And China has been running trade surpluses over the years. And China also has accumulated you know, three to four trillion dollars of foreign exchange reserves, and all this would help China to maintain the kind of solid power in um, issuing its own currency. And so that's kind of an um, um, important uh, point to keep in mind. This is charged to show that you know, China has maintained very healthy growth um, up until very recently. The growth rate has been around 10% on average since the 1980s. Uh, right now, China grow at a 6.7% of growth rate, which is you know, much lower than what it used to be. But still, you know, it's um, envious to the rest of the world, right? Um, <clears throat> so what I would argue is, you know, in up until the 90s, um, China really have this kind of state economy, where state planning economy, where the state provided, you know, financing through the so-called state-owned commercial banks, um, extend credits to the state-owned enterprises to produce, you know, uh, to invest, right, to produce jobs, and so on and so forth. At the onset of the market reform, the state oil enterprises account for about 80% of output and um, almost 60% or 80% of the employment. And it's really sort of a, a job guarantee um, just through the state oil you know, enterprises, not you know, the government directly hire workers per se, but it does it right through the um, state oil enterprises. So um, the state oil commercial uh, Banks today still accounting for about you know um, forty to sixty percent, still directly forty to sixty percent of their loans to the uh, state owned enterprises, and also the state owned commercial banks accounting for about half of the whole total banking assets. So in other words, the state still play a very primary role in the entire banking sector, right? And so the state owned enterprises then in turn use the kind of bank credit that they get from the state-owned commercial banks to finance their investment, which average on at 13% uh, of growth rate for the fixed capital formation between 1990 and 2015. And that also contributed significantly to the over 50% of the investment to GDP ratio. Now, um, Kerr in his 2008 article incisively summarizes that the financial system stimulated permanently high investment with all this multiplier effect for the other sectors of the economy. 
Due to a high savings <coughs> rate, large increase in income led to both high <coughs> savings and not the other way around. This is paramount evidence, there is paramount evidence that China has managed to create a Schumpeterian Keynesian credit investment income creation process, which has led to economic prosperity. But the credit-driven investment-led growth eventually ran out of steam due mostly to demand constraints. As we all know, you know investment is a double-edged, double-blade, double-edged double, double double <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> um, blade, right? And it created demand, but it also created large supply capacity, right? Which needs to be absorbed by final consumption, either domestically or by the rest of the world. And that didn't happen. And so by um, 2012, China's growth has been slowing down. And debt to GDP ratio has increased tremendously to right now about 254% of the GDP. Um, and that created the so-called Fed you know, crisis, right? I mentioned in the media, the offset, you know, the sort of Minsky moment the debt crisis. I would call it debt conundrum um, because I don't think there will be sort of a really you know, debt deflation type of crisis that will be you know, erupting soon in China, but I do think that, especially for the private sector, um, more in debt could have some long-term negative implications. In any case, um, the corporate sector is the one that I think most problematic in terms of the entire sort of the debt conundrum, um, because the capacity to pay for these debt obligations in the private sector has been dwindling, has been declining, and one of the most important reasons is because as China engages in so-called rebalancing, trying to slow down its fixed investment, it brings down the corporate profits, and that makes it you know, difficult for them to meet their debt obligations. Also, late local governments are the ones that you know, have a large debt problems, and the main reason for that is structural, right? The local governments receive about 40% of debt tax revenues, they remit 60% to the central government, but the local governments accounted for 80% of the local expenditure. So there's structural mismatch between you know, their tax revenues and their spending obligations. Now, the current programs that the Chinese government implemented trying to resolve this debt problem, they simply shift debt from one sector to the other or shift from one state branch to the other. So for example, one of the uh, uh, measures was to develop the so-called you know, municipal bond market uh, in 2015. The, like, the local governments now are allowed to issue bonds um, in bonds market. But that you know, still doesn't solve the problem, right? Instead of having bank loans for the local governments, they're now just you know, raising bonds, um, issuing bonds in the market. So instead of a bank credit crisis, now it's a bond crisis. And so on and so forth, right? From you know, local government to the state or enterprises, which is basically the public-private initiative. Um, but none of this really solved the issue, right? Of the, that problem. So this is a picture of the different sectors and their share of the um, national debt. So as you see, the last year that I have the data here, the state enterprises have about 101 debt to GDP ratio, and um, private corporation 55, household 28, local government 21, sorry, 40, and the central government 21 percent. So this is sort of a um, different sort of breakdown. So what should the government do? What could the government do? Right, having you know, as we talk about the sovereign power to issue currency, I think the central government needs to take a much more direct role and much more you know, instrumental role in solving this problem to deal with the debt, the, the, the flow problem, right? The increasing the expansion of um, credit. Um, the government's deficit spend, right? As Young Craig, oh, sorry, as Brent Ray and um, Eric um, Tumoy wrote in their book chapter. A government spending-led um, expansion would allow the private sector to expand without creating a drought that would cheat. Government deficit would add statutory debt to private portfolios, even as it raised profits through the Kolesky equation, and income and employment through government spending multiplier. So right now, um, this is the sectoral balance in China. If you look at the last year, the data that I have in 2016, basically the public um, deficit of 3.7% of GDP as well as the external balance of 1.7% of GDP allowed the private sector to net save in the amount in the order of 5% of the GDP. But you know, as you see from this chart that the Chinese external balance has been going down over the years, largely you know, thanks to the stagnation of you know, global external so global demand. I think China needs to rely all more on the central government um, in order to allow the private sector to make net save. 
Um, so that's the um, another point that the central government's deficit spend in order to allow the domestic economy to deleverage and to net save. Um, it also needs to do this to relieve the SOEs um, from the obligations to invest because China's the Chinese government has been you know, torn between this um, kind of two mission impossible sort of you know in order to deleverage you have to somehow let the private enterprises to earn enough profits and earnings and for that they have to increase the investment but at the same time the Chinese government wanted to rebalance the economy away from the investment to final consumption <coughs> and so that is kind of you know a straight jacket that they're operating in between and so that gets to the last point if we really want to rebalance the economy have a consumption driven economy we need to provide jobs to um, you know the, the workers right right now China's unemployment rate is very low. Official unemployment rate is about 5%, 4 point some percent, right? Just like other developing nations. But that official data does not include the 11, sorry, doesn't include the 110 million um, rural uh, immigrants to the urban sector. So if we add that, and if we add other sort of the layoffs from as, uh, the state-owned enterprises that are not included in the official unemployment rate, we could have an employment, unemployment rate of 12.9%. Um, so again, you know, in China, by the way, if you're talking about you five know, percent unemployment rate, that's to translate to about ten million people, right, who could have worked but not. So I think that it's very important that you know, in the past, the government, uh, central government, through the SOEs, provide job guarantees to urban workers, and that system is no longer in place. But I think you know the way to re provide sustainable, stable, balanced growth we still need to resort to kind of some transformation of the old model. Um, so that is. Um, to deal with the, the flow, to deal with the stock problem, the current debt problem, block rents, or increase the, the taxing power to the local governments. That why offs with uh, corporate governance reform in the SOEs if they really wanted to you know, do that route. Um, I don't see any problem have the state enterprises take on all the sort of investments, job pr provis provisions and whatnot. But if that is not what the government wants, right, then what the government needs to do is to directly you know, step into the sort of investment and job creation kind of um, tasks. And capital injections to the state wind prices and also the asset management uh, corporations if we wanted to solve this you know, sort of banking sector um, um, debt binge. Um, so I think I kind of used up my time and that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for your time. Story. So 2006 maybe, yeah, I and myself were on a plane going to Argentina, is that the right year? Uh, to see Daniel Kozar, who had set up the uh, HEPES program. Can you speak up more? Yep. Uh, is it better? The mic. the mic is just for the camera, but oh. I can't hear you. Oh, ignore the mic. <laughs> but hold in front of the mic. Okay, so it was about 2006. <laughs> uh, we were on an airplane going down to uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina, to talk to them about we uh, starting the HEPES program, which was offering a job for at the time all heads of households looking to work. They, uh, Daniel Kosar was the uh, with the Argentine Labor uh, Ministry. He had started this program in 2001, not long after the <coughs> exchange rate broke and the peg broke, and after there were 32 dead in the street in Buenos Aires or whatever it took. <coughs> and they had. Um, brought in this program where they offered a job to any head of household and they got something like two million people into this program uh, on a population of maybe 35 million, that's a lot of people. And within a few years, something like a million of them transitioned into private sector work. And these were people who had ne they had never expected any of them to be able to get a private sector job. They were Indians and other disadvantaged people and the whole thing. So, and the UMKC, uh, Students and professors went down and documented everything. It's been a great case study. So anyway, so we go back. He said 2006 they had dropped the program because he was gone and the next person used the money in the budget for something else. I don't know. So they were running into labor bottlenecks. So we go down to talk about it. And we get, so we get into this meeting with central bankers and the Progressive Institute. And I'm making a pitch as to why they should start this thing again, offer a job. And one of them says to me, well, what do you think the wage should be? So I said, well, what's the minimum wage in the economy? And he said, like, 600 pesos a month, which is maybe $200. And uh, 
I said, well, maybe you don't want to be disruptive and pull anybody out of the private sector, so maybe 100 pesos a month. Okay, so he says to me, this is supposedly a first world country, right? Well, if we pay those people that much money, some of them might eat. <laughs> he looks at the time. <laughs> Daniel turned red, you know, and I, I, I don't miss a beat. I just say to this guy, I said, well, look, if the purpose of your current institutional arrangements is to make sure a substantial amount of your population will never eat any meat, you're already doing a good job and you don't need to address this presentation. <laughs> so then they turn around and start talking in Spanish for a couple of minutes. <laughs> he comes back and he says, well, these are guys in suits and everything. Right? We, we've decided that it, it might be okay if some of them ate some meat, so we'd like to hear the rest of the presentation. <laughs> Development policy for emerging markets. Exactly the same conversation in Tunisia. They might same buy thing. wheat, they might buy... <laughs> yeah. Like, yes, they yeah. should. Yeah. <laughs> or, okay. So, this was written probably back in the late 90s, <coughs> and uh, it was done shortly after uh, Paul Davidson had published my first paper, Full Employment and Price Stability, which he was back there somewhere, I thought I saw him, and uh, which he worked with me on for quite a while, because I had never had any idea how you'd write a paper or publish a paper or do anything else. And then after that, they said, well, it'd be good to do it for a specific thing, so this, I did this paper, uh, on uh, for an uh, economic development plan for Palestine, Palestinians, West Bank, and Gaza. And then it was picked up by Mideast Inside Magazine, and Jonathan Cohn was the editor, and he liked it, and he brought me around Washington to try and get it implemented. I met with Arafat's brother-in-law, and the Israeli uh, economists, and all these kinds of people. And they all liked it, they, they wanted to do this. And then the Camp David thing blew up after Arafat was offered what they thought was everything and didn't take it and the war started, so it never happened. But uh, and then he tried to pick it up again a couple of years ago. Anyway, and then this morning I took, uh, Fidel gave me 20 minute notice, so I took the paper and turned it into this <laughs> slide presentation. So here we go. The, ba the backbone of all societies is public service. Legal, education, blah, blah, blah. that's what a modern economy is all about. We present an institutional framework for implementing a public service program that will provide both the essential public services and foster private sector development and growth. It is internally stable and requires no external finance. It empowers the government to provide public service jobs without limit to anyone willing and able to work. Sounds familiar? Okay. This is in the first instance. This isn't into a place where there's unemployment you're trying to do it. This is a clean sheet of paper stuff. It starts with this. By providing a means to employ all the labor that is currently idle in the public sector until private sector demand increases, a peaceful and prosperous environment is promoted. Throughout history, a government that can provide full employment and prosperity has always demanded the respect of both its citizens and the world at large. All right, here's how you do it. Number one, the PA, that's the Palestinian Authority, will impose a requirement, coercion, that all residence owners submit receipts for 200 hours of qualifying public service uh, per residence. So every dwelling has a tax slapped on it that you have to pay. If you don't pay it, the place will get sold at public auction. Okay. Number two, residents have the choice of doing public service work themselves or obtaining the receipts from others. There are these jobs, but you don't have to do that. You can go out and grow tomatoes or raise chickens and sell it to somebody else who wants to work for extra hours. Okay, so you don't have to do that. However, the, nobody is going to lose their house in this program who doesn't want to work, because there's jobs for everybody that pay enough to um, support your, your tax, plus make a living. And so if anybody decides is in danger of losing his house, it's because he was not willing to work to support the community. And that person becomes an outcast, a social outcast. So it puts all the incentives in the right place. The requirement creates an immediate need for public service receipts Okay, what is that all about? People looking for paid work. What do we call those people? Unemployed. Okay, so what happens is we don't have any unemployment there and as defined by people looking for work that pays this stuff, the receipts. There's plenty of people looking for work that pays hard currencies, dollars, yen, whatever, shekels, but not these. Okay, so the first thing you have to do is create unemployment to find as people looking for paid work in your currency. Immediately. Residents, so that incites them, so that incites them, incites them to apply for public service work, 
are offered goods and services to other citizens, as we just discussed. <coughs> PA will then offer qualifying public service employment to anyone willing and able to work. So all these people will show up for work to the extent that the economy needs the receipts, the PARs, to help the city and authority receives uh, to pay tax or the ones they want to net save and have their uh, you know use for financial assets. This will, this will supply the net financial assets to the economy. PA will issue receipts as evidence of hours worth. The receipts will carry the inscription, this is a receipt for community service labor. It'll be issued in denominations of one, five, and 10 hours. It could be further divided 10 times into six minute coins. Okay, so for change. So if you work an hour, you get a receipt for one hour, that's one. Proposed annual liability of for 200 hours of service represents about four hours per week, which is about 10% of the typical work year. It means that anybody can get a job to get his house paid. We're not going to be taking any homes away. The European Union, they put a property tax on and then they don't have jobs and then people lose their homes. Okay, this is not anything like that. And you get massive unrest because of a program like that. PARs are freely transferable and can be used acquired either directly from the PA to public service or from others who earn them. Automatic full employment. Anyone willing and able to do public service work, there's a job for you. Okay, so we've eliminated unemployment as defined. Residents will desire to be employed in exchange because they'll either have a requirement to submit them or, or they will see that real goods and services <laughs> being offered by others in exchange for PARs who don't want to do the work. So you'll see things for sale which incents you to work. It's a market type of a relative value situation develops. <clears throat> Total issues, issuance of PAR is market determined. How much is the spending? Depends on how many people show up for work. It's determined by the market. Okay, so it'll be, quote, the right amount to be consistent with the wage. Anyway, the Palestinian Authority spends first, after which it collects taxes, taxes are paid. Sounds familiar? Spend first, then collect. No need for finance or borrowing. Okay, it just spends based on what's available for sale, things offered for sale, it can buy. All right. If it spends more than it taxes, those are the money supply, the net financial assets for the economy. It doesn't need to borrow them. It could if it wanted to, if it offered deposits and paid interest, but it, I don't recommend it. That's what other countries do, I don't recommend it. And there is no involvement in the payment or receipt of interest, which is in compliance with their local uh, Sharia law. The market value will be, what will this thing be worth, worth in the market, foreign exchange value? Now, anybody who's familiar with Denison dollars or you and Casey Buckaroos is seeing the same thing here, right? Okay. The market value of one PAR will be a function of the difficulty of obtaining it from the PA. So if it takes one day, uh, to earn one, it'll be worth one day's labor, one day, the value of one day's unskilled labor. The value is determined in the marketplace by what <coughs> other residents, residence owners would pay to buy PARs from someone else rather than do the public work, service work themselves. I don't want to work a day there, I'd rather grow tomatoes and trade tomatoes and get together a fair value, relative value story. In the market economy, you set one price and the rest can reflect relative value. The value is independent of the quantity issued or received, provided that it only issues them for public service labor at that wage and does not refuse to hire anyone uh, willing and able to work. The PAR will be internally stable without foreign exchange reserves, regardless of international trade balances. Now the Buckaroo from the UMKC has done the same thing where they wanted student labor. And they notice the point of this, the story starts with a government trying to provision itself. The school did the same thing. They wanted to provision themselves with student labor doing, to do community service. So they put a tax on all the students of 20 hours of service and you could go do this work and earn a buckaroo, they called it, for one hour of service. Some students didn't want to go work one hour of service that semester or whatever or fell short, so they tried to buy them from other students. They had a foreign exchange value. Back in the early 90s, that was maybe $5 each. Last year, I hear it was twenty dollars. Okay, so this thing has appreciated, but it hasn't. It's internally stable. It buys one hour of student labor. Student labor 
in nominal terms, has gone up in price. There's been an inflation in U.S. dollar terms. This has been the most stable currency in the world. <laughs> Small, open economy. Every other currency going around. Okay? Uh, and unlimited deficit spending. They just say it. students can earn as many as they want. Zero interest rate policy. Totally stable uh, currency. And it's outperformed the S&P 500. <laughs> Is it a bubble? <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. So the par will be internally stable without foreign exchange reserves. No foreign exchange reserves at UMKC backing the start. And regardless of international trade balance. And I think your dollars are the same, right? Yep. Same story. The PA will have the option of purchasing <laughs> other goods and services with PAR. So they don't have to just buy all this labor showing up. But, and that spending will be limited operationally, not politically. Politically, you make your decision by whatever is offered for sale. If somebody walks up trying to sell a car for 5,000 of these PARs, they can buy it if they want. They've got all they want. That's not the problem. You just credit the account or give you the paper ones, however they do it. And uh, by the way, this model is expanded for banking a little bit later, but at this point in time, it wasn't. The, the uh, PIR reduces the need of, okay. The thing is, if they spend somewhere else, they're gonna get fewer people showing up for the, um, unskilled labor job for the basic job. They're offering one a day for anybody who wants a job. There's going to be a certain amount of people, enough to pay the tax and to save. If they start paying for other things, now the economy is getting the money to pay the tax and to save through a different avenue. There'll be less, the economy will be sending fewer people to show up for this work. So they will see their pool of people showing up for this public service work dropping as they spend PAR other places. If they want the pool to go up, they would have to raise taxes or cut the other spending, fiscal adjustment. This additional spending reduces the need of residents owners to obtain parts through the public service labor. Okay, because they're getting it other ways. This reduces the amount of public service labor. Specialized individuals will likely be desired for public service. These will be doctors, lawyers, accountants, engineers, teachers. Uh, will be, and in a market economy, they will be able to make more than one a day, one per hour in the economy where people are coming and showing up for work and they'll be earning those and paying other people to go to work. You, you're gonna have to pay more to hire them, okay? Which you can do. You go ahead and hire them, but then you're gonna get fewer of the others. Now, in this, this particular economy, you're gonna have a massive amount of the population initially going for this job and earning what they need. And so as you hire the people you need in the more sophisticated jobs, that pool will go down and you can actually replace, continue to hire to get fully staffed the public sector and get this pool down to one or two percent that will just continually be transitioning due to the fluctuation of the economy. Okay. So to attract these other individuals, you pay a market wage, which will exceed one PAR per hour. The spending will reduce the number of hours worked by those given the stated rate of one per hour. And this is all found in Pavlina. Chairman, is Pavlina here now? She did a yeah, tell math model, it's still on my website on monopoly pricing in this type of a model. And, uh, okay, so a couple of other characteristics. Automatic stabilization, which we just talked about. The size of this pool is gonna be shrinking and growing cyclically. Uh, and enforcement, you've got to enforce the tax liability or it doesn't work. It's all a coercive system. Uh, providing Palestinian Authority with this means will allow it to build public infrastructure. You know, it'll be nice public infrastructure. Okay, keeping the population gainfully employed promotes polit uh, political stability. There's no unemployment. Private sector economic activity will immediately benefit and flourish. That's where we're at. Now, this is without going through all these things that people do to try and get the private sector going. When I think you don't have to do that, they'll figure it out. You don't want to put obstacles in front of the private sector, certainly, but, you know, but they will figure it out. Private sector. The region will be financially independent and not held hostage to outside funding. Economic growth and social and political stability attracts both domestic and foreign investment, which can be incented to further public purpose. You don't let in just any foreign investment because you need the money or you need the jobs. You've already got full employment. You pick and choose what makes sense for you for public purpose. Conclusion. Sound, practical means of advancing a nation it's a plan for an internally stable system that entails no foreign interference, no foreign debt, no external finance, uh, with financially independent government, 
West Bank and Gaza will experience unprecedented economic power and prestige while remaining far removed from financial burdens and instabilities. It was published June 2001 in Reedy's Insights Magazine. And I think I've used up my time. Thank you. Thank you. serious proposition in order to develop the underdeveloped economy. Uh, naturally, most of us at least uh, agree that the roots of uh, underdevelopment is colonialism, imperialism, and economic dependency. And economic dependency cannot be eliminated without advanced technological progress. Therefore, as Professor Young addressed the issue, the necessary step for underdeveloped countries to eliminate the problem of dependency and, under, and poverty uh, is to engage in what is known as industrial policy. The industrial policy that was initially used by Japanese and then later on used by uh, Koreans very successfully, and since 2000 is being used by China. So. Um, Professor Liang elaborated on that a little bit more. Uh, I, I would, over the last several years, uh, my research on the subject has been essentially about Iran and recently China also. And uh, I don't have the time to really elaborate on that. So, but uh, I think that's something we need to look about in the future. Okay. Uh, I think I have I do think that uh, sustainable uh, agriculture is extremely important, just to add. Uh, but uh, I do, uh, my first question for uh, uh, Warren Mosler, uh, for number one, uh, what challenges, what political challenges do you foresee for Palestine to implement uh, the plan that you have described, given that, well, Israel is sitting in the middle of it, and it's also, you know, got it benefits from cheap, um, highly unemployed, I mean, unemployed reserves of labor in Palestine uh, to do the care tasks, to do the house cleaning, that kind of thing, you know, basically care economy. Uh, that's one. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, I mean, sometimes I think of the reason why, I mean, you know, there is a, in India, for instance, there is definitely a tendency to uh, some, to stand up for right to employment. It's very important in India, but that's, a, some, you know, that's just one tendency and it tends to uh, get voted out. We have this tendency to continuously vote for neoliberal governments. And I think that's because that we, aren't, we need to talk about our rhetorical <coughs> spaces and try to capture the ideological state of paralysis and that might need a discussion of empire. Thank you. There's one more question. Given how important climate change is and how it's in everyone's best interest to address it, does MMT in the United States also open up foreign policy options that would allow the United States to help the global south? I mean, could we, for example, monetize these MMT projects around clean energy or things like that? You know, wonder how does MMT allow us in the United States to help some of these projects in the global south? Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. Maybe one of my way to the front. I could also ask for the do you think that the widespread adoption of a job guarantee across what is generally seen as developing countries necessitates something happening in the US or in one of the advanced economies as a demonstration of that? Thank you all. Uh, I'd like to uh, enter the, the first comment about uh, uh, aquaponics. I, I, did, I didn't argue that 
that we should give up industrialization. But uh, industrialization of the kind that we see in Tunisia and many developing countries, low value added content and race to the bottom type of industrialization has not worked. That has not worked yet. Unless you invest in research and development and technical skills so that you're climbing up the food chain in terms of value added uh, content. Um, and I would disagree with, with aquaponics or, and sustainable agriculture not being a solution. Uh, th there's a sustainability aspect of it uh, in terms of growing food locally as opposed to bringing a salad from 300 miles away. There's, there's that aspect. There's the, the quality of food that you're growing locally that's much more sustainable and healthier. And I focused in, in my presentation on the, kind of the, the, the towns of the interior, which, which are completely disconnected from the rest of the country in terms of access to um, protein, for example. Warren talked about the meat issue. Uh, growing fish for food consumption. This is not decorative fish, obviously. Um, then there is the water issue. Uh, and I forgot to mention that with aquaponics, you're saving 90%, 95, up to 95% of the water compared to traditional agriculture. And that's not a, that's not a light issue um, in the Middle East. Did Mexico City Used to what? Mexico City used to give up to the farmers. Right. So she so it's not provided the entire yeah. output for the process. So it's it's not a it's not a small thing. I mean you can do a small scale thing in your garage or in your backyard, but it can sustain an entire nation. We just need to invest in the resources and build up the system and build up the skills. Um, and if you and if you close that gap in terms of your trade deficit, then you have resources to direct towards research and development and industrial development of the kind that you're describing. But right now we're told we don't have the resources to feed people. We can't afford it unless we get funding external. Um, in terms of um, Stephen's question about what can you know the, the, the developed world do, uh, I think Jan's, uh, Jan's slide about the, the net flow of financial resources to the tune of 500, 600 um, billion dollars a year, that's money flow, that's net. And that's money flowing from poor countries to rich countries. So the financing is going the other way. I mean, we think of financing coming from the rich world to the developing world. It's not. It's going the other way. Right? So we, we need to scrap that model of reliance on external finance. And if a lot of people ask, well, what do we do with the external debt? Well, there's some people call it debt forgiveness. I don't like the term. Debt cancellation or debt swaps of different kinds. So you can do climate change debt swaps, where you're swapping debt for building renewable energy resources or building, you know, uh, or financing uh, domestically, financing with domestic resources, financing climate change uh, action uh, at the local level in return for canceling uh, external debt. So that's the kind of help that, that, that can work. But the, the help that we're used to, which is loans and loans and interest, is, is not working. It's, it's backfiring big time, and it's not new. It's, you've seen the slide, it's, it's happening for decades. And it's as if nobody's paying attention. Okay, so um, just a quick overview. You know, you know, ancient Athens was a pretty nice place to live. They, have, they built a nice city. And they had a pretty good thing going in literature and theater. <laughs> okay, and ancient Rome. I mean, people still go there and borrow and like living in the old buildings, okay? They had no IMF, they had no World Bank, they had no electricity, no bulldozers, no diesel fuel. They didn't have any of these things. Right? You, know, it, you can do this. It's about how you, I mean, it took, a, it took more than a day to build it, but it was a nice place. <laughs> it, could, it can be done, okay? And it's all about how you organize your labor. When you get up in the morning, Japan has no resources that I know. Anybody discover any day? Okay, so... Well, what's the difference between Japan and, you know, Gaza? It's what you do when you get up in the morning. And I'm not trying to over, overly stereotype this, but just for illustration. You know, if you're in a place where they get up in the morning and they pick up rocks and start putting them together and building things, you get one kind of society. If you're in a place where you pick up rocks and throw it through your neighbor's window, you get a different kind of society. So it's all about how we organize and put our labor together that can turn any place into a nice place to live. And right now, the emerging market countries have far more resources than ancient Rome or ancient Athens ever did. And all this industrial stuff is dirt cheap. I mean, that's that you can't keep that stuff out. If you ask these countries, what's your problem? 
look at the chart. You know what the problem is? Too many imports. It's not like, oh, what happens if you can't import? There's too many imports to try to do something about. It. So the whole thing's been, the, whole, the larger picture, the forest has been lost through the trees. If you put together a plan where you can organize your labor with you know, well-directed uh, public service, you're gonna have a very, very nice place to live. You're gonna be a showcase for the world. You don't have to have massive resource consumption. You don't have to have any of these other things. Now, uh, in terms of political challenges, it's not easy, okay? And one of the problems is these people got their educations, they're all Western educated, right? And they got their educations in all these new liberal schools and come back and they know what the answers are. And the same thing happened in China. Uh, where, when were we in China, where we, not in New York, where we met all those Chinese economists? How long ago was that, 20 years ago? Okay, these are the up and coming Chinese economists and we went through this whole thing with them. And it looks like they went back home and did a pretty good job. Their deficit spending was up to something like 25% of GDP if you include state and banks, banking systems. Right? But what happened? Well, all their kids that they sent off to be Western educated at the LSE and Chicago and all that, they came home to roast, ro roast the economy. Now they're all worried about debt ratios and this type of thing. And, the, and that 6, 13% growth has dropped down to six, which by some measures is more like zero in, in the rest of the world because of a whole lot of factors. And so that's the political issue right now is these neoliberal education, well-educated kids coming back and take, taking charge. Uh, and what was the other one? You know, how, how do you get the population to support this type of thing? I was with uh, Paul Thomas, uh, he was a filmer, filmmaker last summer. We went to the UN to talk to these people about going into their refugee camps and setting up something like this so you could turn a refugee camp into a nice place to live. They didn't want that to happen. They want people to leave these camps. They don't want them to stay there. It's like, mm. okay, we're going to tell you. There are political issues. Do the foreign policy thing. What's the hard part? What was the question? What was the question? Whether the U.S. foreign policy. Yeah, whether MNP has any implications for the U.S. foreign policy. Oh, uh, well, well, first of all, they, like, they don't need us. The emerging market can do it on their own. They don't need us. Now, if there is something they do need, it'll be, it won't be difficult to obtain, and we can discuss it at the time. But what can we do? Send Jeff Sachs over to help them? <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, what are we going to do for any, any of these people? You know, we, we've got our own issues of not understanding how to run our own economy with massive unemployment, and we've absolutely crushed. You know, our last progressive government presided over the largest transfer of wealth from low income to high income people in the history of the world. And we're going to go help somebody else with their economy. <laughs> so uh, now, if MMT people go over there, it's not going to be the United States with its resources, apart from our knowledge, and then <coughs> go over there and set up something like this, which we had scheduled to do, and it just fell apart right at the end. Uh, and hopefully, we get another chance to do it somewhere else. So the HEPA's program in Argentina that was the largest the quickest, fastest, and best growing country in the world for three years till they politically shifted it to something else. More than three. More than three? Six, okay. And what about India with the Rural Poor Program? That's working. India is a, kind of a sleeper, but it's got problems, but that segment of it has been functioning very well and it's been strong growth. They criticize them because their deficits are high and their inflation's a few points high, but that, those aren't economic events. And they've got a few distribution problems, <laughs> but, uh, but the, the proposal for what, what's happening is quietly doing its job. I think there's 60 million people in it or something like that. And they've got a corruption issue where if you want a job in this rural poor program where they pay a few kids a day or whatever, you gotta pay off the guy who's running it, or something like that. But you know, they, they're getting- It's down from 50. It's down to 30. 30. It's down to 30? 30% <laughs> leakage. 30% to the administrators, huh? to the corruption. Yeah, so 70% gets the fees. Yeah. Okay, so you know there are those kinds of governance issues, but uh, it, it's certainly you know it's certainly working. I'll, I'll say something about foreign policy. Yeah, um, I'm going to take off my MMP hat and wear my Global South hat. Uh, if, if you're interested in this foreign policy thing, ask your federal government to send you an itemized bill for your taxes, and then it, it, people will wake up and, and realize what's what's going on globally, so, including military budget. By the way, you want it itemized so that you know what you're paying for. Right, and it's taxpayers' money. That's what I've said, said before.
not a legal guy, or anything, but on Warren's first slide, on the top things he put down was uh, <coughs> tax was you needed to do your two hundred dollars hours, uh, two hundred hours, not to lose your house. For, so property rights yep. seem to be very important. So in Tunisia, for example, what, how are the property rights there, and you know how does the government, how is the government able to enforce uh, the payment of the tax? Right. So in Athens, there's probably death or jail. It's a little bit more difficult now. So it's, it's here. You could, right? you could just sell the house. You know, so so for somebody who doesn't have a house, well, he pays through rent. You know, if you rent somewhere, the rent, the tax will be built into the rent. Okay. I mean, just in, in, but see, there in a brand new society with nothing on the ground. Well, there are no other taxes. I had there are no other taxes to enforce. So this is the easiest one to enforce. Okay. That, well, that makes sense, right? Just just practically, it seems in a, in a lot of the developing nations. I mean, in the U.S. is, you know, you don't yeah. mess with the tax guy. Right. Um, in, in other areas, right in an underground market, right, there's, there's a shadow economy because the taxes are unenforceable and there's no property rights. Right. That, that's why it's important not to have those taxes. You know, high compliance costs, you know, corruption, you know, unenforceability, you know, uh, it, it just, they do more, more trouble, they're more trouble than they're worth. Okay. Yeah. And their transactions taxes that reduce transactions, which is a bad thing. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> My field is urban planning, and we're mostly interested in local community development as opposed to national economic development. So I was wondering if any of your ideas here, and particularly this job guarantee idea, could be implemented at the local level, say a municipality or a metropolitan area. What would it look like? What it would take? And do we have any examples to do that? Thanks, that's a great question. Um, First of all, I can't, I can't resist responding to Warren's comment a second ago, but uh, say my explanation for the difference between the performance of Russia and that of China in the 1990s is very simple. The Russians are the Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'll come in very quickly on the urban planning thing. Um, Lachlan Curry, who was well, a Canadian economist who worked actively in the New Deal and was involved in part of the New Deal resettlement policy, urban policy, housing policy, eventually went to uh, Colombia and became an advisor to the Colombian government and produced a national plan which could, uh, I don't know, I'm not sure because I haven't been able to research this, <coughs> which either was a form of an employer of last resort policy or could be easily translated into an employer of last resort policy based on the idea of urban planning. His basic idea was to solve the demand <coughs> problem by supporting construction and supporting housing, but you didn't support housing the way you normally did in a developing country by allowing it simply to proliferate wherever you wanted. You had to have an urban plan, you had to have a transport plan, and you had to have a, a coordinated system in terms of employing your lender, your lender of last resort. So this is why I say it could be easily <coughs> adapted to an ELR program because you could then allocate your construction workers according to a designed urban study plan. I 
Hospital. Most of you are familiar with the uh, Metro boosters that exist now in most Latin American cities. As far as I understand, Curry was the first person who had proposed that in order to try a already, and this was uh, in the 1950s and the 1960s, resolve the dramatic problem of, uh, of let's say, urban automobile congestion that exists in most uh, metropolitan centers. <coughs> In Latin America. So certainly there is a very, very clear uh, linkage and potential linkage between the idea of urban planning and the use of Elon labor in order to use the construction sector as one of the motors of the. Uh, just as an aside, I don't know, the most you probably have never heard of Lawton Curry. Uh, just to, to support his position a little bit, they were always very, very innovative. Well, for example, when he talked about the idea of construction, he argued against providing low-cost housing for uh, low-income families. Because basically he said you would end up with the kind of urban decline and decay that you get in most housing projects that you see in the United States. He said what he said, what you want to do is to provide support for upper-middle-income families to improve their housing. Because if you allow them to improve their housing, then you, they would be vacating housing stock, which is much better than you would be able to produce by the very small government budgets that you would be able to use in order to produce hmm. housing. So this, he had this idea of trying to push people up. Okay, what you need is the financing and the construction in the upper middle uh, income levels, rather than starting at the bottom and producing effectively substandard housing for the low-income people. And this is a problem you can see now, for example, in Brazil, where you had a very large uh, popular housing uh, construction program, in which has produced uh, habitations which are, well, I won't say, they're inadequate, we'll put it. You have to tell Jamie that it's not his fault. <laughs> right, um, so maybe you could go through your comment about the EAP um, aspect of sort of providing jobs and um, projects. Can you can you oh, sorry. Uh, my understanding is that you know, the kind of service, the kind of jobs um, can be done in, at any levels, right? At the national level, local level, municipal level, town level, village. The point is the federal government has to pay. The central government has to pay because they are the ones that really have unlimited financing power. Um, going back to Jamie's question, um, so uh, yes, so land sales is a very important source of revenue for the local governments, and even today, for the local governments that uh, you know borrows essentially from the banks or the shell banks, they set up some platforms, the, the local government funding vehicles, and use the land as collaterals to borrow. And so, first of all, that is not sustainable because it's limited among plots you know, of land to sell. And second, it also messes with the asset market. Right? One of the reasons that the Chinese real asset market is always you know, having the sort of, you know, it's in the boom, it's rising prices, and have a lot of to do with the local governments using, you know, upholding the land value. Um, so that is definitely not a sustainable or a, um, you know, a stable way of raising local government finance. <laughs> and then in terms of the capital control, so um, since 1994, the Chinese government um, lifted the control on the current account, so it allows for trade flows, but it has taken a very tight grip on the capital account. So foreign direct investment is always welcome, um, but portfolio investments is always sort of under pretty tight control. Of course, it's not porous. There are still a lot of you know, um, um, you know, unaccounted for sort of unaccounted for capital flows, but still the kind of control on capital flows helps to stabilize the foreign exchange rates. Thank you. Yeah. On the uh, idea of local planning and whatnot, so, how, yeah. so my rollout proposal for a, 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 what I call the transition job in the United States, for example, um, <coughs> my rollout for the U.S. would be to uh, open it up first to all federal employees. You go to the supervisors and you say, any of you want to add staff to your department who will work at this uh, transition job wage, maybe $10 an hour, knowing it's probably going to be temporary because 
once they've been working, they're going to be attractive to the private sector, so they, they can hire away. You can hire anybody you want. You can add as many people as you want. And then maybe 30 days later, you go to the state governments. Okay, now you can do this. And then the local governments. You can get anybody you want at this transition job wage. Uh, no, they're probably going to be transitory, but they can, they can do that. And then the nonprofits. Okay, go to them. And I think by that time, you've picked up anybody you know, willing and able to work. But if, if you haven't, then we can look at expanding it from there. And look, local, even on this thing, you know, you need local planning. It's critical. Okay, because if you don't, if you don't, it, it's just your odds of getting it right are almost almost nothing. It just makes, and, and it's all about what serves social and political purpose when you, when you do something like that. The private sector won't do that. But so that's a good note, I think, on which to finish. I'm sorry, we're out of we're out of time now. Please join me in thanking. Uh, yeah, I'm going to